There are many reasons why the Slot 1 platform is so popular with retro PC gamers. If you look at a typical motherboard, we can see straight away we're having ISA, PCI and HEP. So we're getting a real nice range of options. Slot 1 is very comfortable with both MS-DOS and Windows 98. Let's say you want to build a machine with a focus on MS-DOS. Well, you will really appreciate the ISA slots. You can use a Sound Blaster 16, for example, with excellent compatibility. And for the graphics, something like an S3 Trio 64 or Verge will give you really nice DOS compatibility. If your focus is more on Windows 98, you can use the HEP slot, use something like a Voodoo 3 or a NVIDIA GeForce or ATI Radeon and then you can use the PCR slots for a Creative Labs Sound Blaster Live Audigy or Audigy 2 card and if you really want to use both yeah you can also do that build a hybrid machine you can even install a ISA and PCI sound card in Windows disable the ISA sound card in device manager and under DOS just only initialize the ISA Sound Blaster and you're good to go. Because of this flexibility, you can cover a wide range of games. Now there are edge cases where a different system is better. For example, if you wanna play very old speed sensitive games, you're better off with the Socket 7 platform, a Pentium MMX processor, because that one has certain CPU flags that you can manipulate through software to really slow it down to 386 and 486 levels. The other edge case is if you want very high performance, then you're better off with an Athlon 64 or a Pentium 4, for example, playing total annihilation at 1080p, that is very demanding. But the slot one system is not slow at all. You can get Pentium 3 processors up to one or 1.1 gigahertz. That is very fast and at the bottom end, a Celeron 266 is as slow as it gets. Pro tip number one, especially for those of you who want to build a Pentium 3 system, you can get two versions of the Pentium 3. One is built on the older 250 nanometer process, uses around two volts of core voltage. Contrast that with the copper mine core, that one runs at around 1.6 volts and consumes much less power. We're talking for the same Pentium 3 running at 500 megahertz. The older Cutmy core will consume around 30 watts of power, whereas the newer copper mine only around 13. So that is quite some power savings. Slot 1 motherboards use the ATX form factor and that makes life much easier when building a computer. I just whip together parts on a test bench, but not everyone is like that. Most of you want a proper tower or desktop case. And here, if you have an AT motherboard, the options are much more limited. ATX also means a nice layout for cable management. I've seen some of your builds and they're absolutely beautiful, putting them in a modern case with nice fans. You also get the benefit of the ATX power supply. So you can rush out by a modern power supply with high efficiency and it will work just fine with this mainboard. Many modern power supplies, when you're not loading them too much, the fan will actually stop rotating so it's nice and quiet. And also a technical detail about computers and power supplies. The older computers they used, uh, most of the current would come from the five volt rail. This is different. Modern power supplies use most of the power from the 12 volt rail. In some cases that can cause issues, especially if you're building an AMD Athlon or Athlon XP. Some of these processors can pull up to 70 watts and modern power supplies just don't have enough current on the five volt rail. The good news is with slot one, you will not run into that issue. Pick a processor that's a little bit on the lower power consumption, 13 or 20 watts, that's all they're consuming. So you can use a modern power supply without any concerns. Pro tip number two, if you're in the market for a slot one CPU, I recommend look out for one that has a third party cooler ready to go like this one here. They are really easy to take apart. They are nice and easy to clean. You can reapply the thermal paste without too many issues. 
And they also make it very easy to replace the fan. Most of these fans are quite old and noisy, so you can just buy a 50 millimeter aftermarket fan and give that slot one CPU some TLC. Also guys, I'm now on Patreon where you get access to behind the scene footage and lots of other content that doesn't really make it into a YouTube video, including one where I'm cleaning up this slot one CPU. In my experience, slot one motherboards seem to last. They're built very reliably and sturdy. Recently, I went to a recycler and I purchased a 30 kilogram bag of old scrap motherboards and most of them were absolute garbage. So I didn't quite get my, my value <laughs> out of that uh, deal. However, I was really surprised. All the old motherboards seemed to work. In total, there were three slot one motherboards and all of them fired up just fine. I love it and really appreciate it when old computer parts are still well documented and supported. And that means the manufacturers still have their websites up and running. The three ports I have are from ECS, Asus and Gigabyte and all three still have the pages live. You can go there, download the user manual, which is very important, but also drivers and of course the latest BIOS version. Pro tip number three is checking the documentation very carefully in regards to the revision of what motherboard you're trying to buy. Now, back in the day, things moved really quickly and motherboard revisions, they would often address certain compatibility issues with yeah, certain parts. This one is a good example. It's from Asus. We have the P3BF. This one is revision 1.04. And if you go to the ACES website and have a look at these supported CPUs, you will find that if you're using a Pentium 2 400 or something like that, it will work on all the PCB revisions. But if you're trying to run a Pentium 3 800 megahertz, then the documentation shows that you want to have a motherboard with revision 1.04. Slot 1 motherboards are also very easy to work with. So it's a good entry for a beginner into retro PC gaming. If you've ever built a computer, the ATX form factor, it will look very similar. From the front panel headers to where you plug in the power supply, you get USB, PS2, so you get sort of a bridge between old and new, making it really easy to work with. Instead of jumpers, most motherboards are configured through dip switches. A worst case scenario is the good old 486. For example, if you have one that takes a DX4 processor, there are so many jumpers for the voltage, the front side bus, the multiplier, as well as the cache size. If you don't have the manual that comes with your motherboard, then good luck. It will be quite challenging to get it going. With slot one, this is much easier. Look up the CPU in the manual, configure the dip switches and off you go. However, most of these motherboards have auto configuration automatically detecting the settings and the voltages or letting you dial in settings through software in the BIOS. Pro tip number four is read the user manual very carefully, especially the section explaining all the jumpers. There can be some surprises in there. For example, this motherboard is from Gigabyte. It's the 6BXC. This one has a few interesting jumpers. One of them is a turbo mode and you want to set that jumper if you want to run the front side bus at over 100 megahertz. The revision 2.0 of this motherboard also has a jumper if you're using a Voodoo 3. This is because Voodoo 3 HEP graphics cards, they would pull more power than some motherboards could handle. So if this is you and you have such a motherboard, definitely set that jumper for best compatibility. One of Intel's best chipset, you can find it on the slot one platform. It is nothing other than the famous Intel 440BX chipset. It is very mature, stable, reliable, and it is, it is also loved by the community thanks to overclocking. So back in the day, a very popular way to get more performance was buying a Celeron, specifically the Celeron 300A, a 66 megahertz front side bus CPU, configure the motherboard to run at 100 megahertz, and then you would have performance at the level of a much more expensive 
Pentium 2. The 440BX chipset has such a good reputation that you can find it in many virtual machines and emulators. For this reason, I urge you, if you are on the market for a slot 1 motherboard, insist on an Intel 440BX chipset. There are motherboards with the wire chipset. Now, they might work, and if you really have no other option, well, it's better than getting punched in the face, but really, Intel 440BX, this is the chipset that gives the slot 1 system the stability, the maturity, the compatibility, and yeah, it's just part of the whole adventure. I don't have one here to show you, but another nice feature about the slot 1 platform is the socket adapters. So if you take slot and socket and you mash them together, you get these adapters called sockets. And they will let you use socket 370 CPUs on slot 1. And yeah, why would you do that? Well, high clocked slot 1 Pentium 3 CPUs are really hard to find. For example, the 1 gigahertz model with the 100 megahertz front side bus. Yeah, good luck finding one. However, the equivalent version on socket 370, yeah, you can pick them up for a fairly reasonable price. You just have to find a decent socket and there are many versions. The big manufacturers like Asus, Gigabyte, MSI, they would all make their own sockets. And yeah, pro tip for this one, make sure you get documentation or at least the jumper settings are uh, written on the PCB because otherwise it's really hard to figure out yourself. And finally, the slot one platform is so popular and loved because of nostalgic reasons. And you can't argue with nostalgia. It is just an emotion that is very powerful. For example, in my situation, I did have a Pentium 2 300 back in the day. I had a Voodoo 2. I'm not quite sure what my main GPU was. And for the sound, I believe I had a Sound Blaster 16 plug and play or something like that. And yeah, that system, it was absolutely fantastic. The Pentium 2, Pentium 3 era was also the era of the internet, at least in my home country in Austria. I bought my first dial-up modem with the Netscape browser. Yeah, uh, discovering a whole wide world out there. And I think that resonates with many of you. A lot of schools at that time also got the internet and universities and yeah, very likely you had your own, your first online experiences on a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3. So guys, we had a look at the slot one platform and I shared with you my take on why this system, this platform, these CPUs, these mainboards are so popular and really sought after in the retro PC gaming community. I would love to hear what is your take on this platform. Do you have a slot one machine as your main retro gaming PC or do you prefer something else? So share your stories down below. I love reading them. I read every comment. What I, what I do is <laughs> I go out in the morning for a cup of coffee and then I catch up on all your comments. So yeah, I'm really enjoying that aspect of what I do. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Do check out my Patreon and consider supporting me and my work. And that's it for this one. I shall see you soon with another one.